Hey everyone, this is Dan Cohen with Behind the Headlines. Today I'm speaking with Brian Becker, host of The Socialist Program, which uh, you can find uh, on all platforms online. And I highly encourage everyone to check out. We're going to be talking about the events of January 6th, namely the insurrection, the coup, call it what you will, at the Capitol here in Washington, D.C. Um, I think Brian has had some of the most insightful and really important analysis, and I you know, want to um, get that out there and, and talk to him um, because it's, you know, such an important moment for, you know, the left and everyone who opposes um, what's happening in this country uh, to understand. So, um, Brian, thanks a lot for joining me. First, um, you know, we have seen, you know, I, I really, I think we just have to establish the nature of the events that took place. Um, and, you know, that this was a fascistic coup attempt, which is kind of, you know, seems to be in question for um, some people, you know, I've seen some kind of various takes on the left. Um, you know, I'll just speak for myself. I was actually there live streaming. I was in, you know, some of the more hardcore elements of the crowd. I was right outside when Ashley Babbitt, the Trump supporter, was shot and killed by police. Um, the infamous um, Auschwitz camp sweatshirt guy, was actually right next to me for a while. I didn't even realize that was him until uh, later. Um, and, you know, once I saw his shirt, but, you know, there can be really no doubt in my mind that this was a totally fascist. The, the hardcore of it was, was a fascist crowd um, with even, you know, World War II era fascist uh, Nazi um, uh, insignias and this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I think that should be obvious, but I think, you know, on the political level um, in different agencies, there was also... Um, you know, what, what shows was a real coup attempt. Um, so, you know, if you can break down what we know to this point, and, you know, who were the players involved? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I'm, I'm grateful to you that you were able to, to be there and to see it. Um, from my point of view and the team at the socialist program, um, there was no question that this was a, a fascist mob. It wasn't simply a group of Trump supporters who had grievances or had been misled. This was a planned operation. Uh, there was no National Guard reinforcements for the Capitol Police. Trump called the rally at noon uh, at the Ellipse, 16, 17 blocks west of the Capitol. That was designed so that people could march on the Capitol just prior to the Congress carrying out its lawful uh, and legally mandated requirement to certify the electoral vote and thus ensure the peaceful transfer of power to the next administration. The fact that the, uh, the language of Rudy Giuliani trial by combat and, and Trump's own language saying, you can't show weakness, we have to be ready to fight. The march is called alternatively March for Trump or Save America. Trump presented to the crowd that election day was not November 3rd, it was actually January 6th, and that they were witness to a fraud and that if they could just move and stop the vote, uh, and if they, or if they could convince uh, Pence to take action, that then they could reclaim the office, regardless of the fact that Trump lost the election. So uh, this was a seditious conspiracy incited by Trump, organized by Trump, the fact that there were no National Guard deployed, even though the mayor had requested it, uh, the fact that even when the 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 Capitol had been breached, uh, and the and the Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund uh, urgently called the Department of Defense, Secretary of the Army, asking for reinforcements. That was at a little bit after 2:20 p.m. on January 6th. Uh, those that final approval didn't arrive for hours. Can you imagine Congress people fearing for their lives? A mob chanting, "Hang Pence! Hang Pence!" Uh, you know, members of the, the elected members of Congress fleeing for their lives, Capitol Police being, and Metropolitan Police being beaten, uh, dragged down the stairs, one of the police officers beaten to death. And under those circumstances, there's not an urgent response from the Department of Defense. It shows that uh, there was a, a conspiracy, that there was a, in, this was an inside job. Uh, we have now Democratic legislators saying that they witnessed their Republican counterparts, half, more than half of whom voted against the certification of Biden, that they were doing sort of reconnaissance tours with the people who the day before so that people could learn the lay of the land at the Capitol. 
the, the, the attackers had all the maps. They were able to find James Clyburn's office and hard to find places. Uh, they knew what they were doing. There's a member of Congress who said the panic button, I think, uh, uh, was ripped out of her desk ahead of time. Ayanna, Ayanna Presley, she said when she went to find the panic button that, that exists for all the members of Congress, it had been ripped out inexplicably, unless it is explicable. Uh, again, the, secre- uh, the, the Capitol Police Chief, Stephen Sunt, who I actually happen to know because uh, he used to be with the Met- Metropolitan Police Department and I was interacting with him o- about demonstration permits for 20 years, uh, he's not an ideological right winger. He's not a hardcore Trumper at all. He he resigned. He fell on his sword. But he says that he was he asked his superiors, that would be uh, the sergeant of arms at the House and the Senate for reinforcements the day before. They said no. He asked them for reinforcements that afternoon while they're, the building is overrun. They said no. Now, by the way, the, the, not only did the sergeant of arms resign, but when media and, and others, including the police, went to his apartment in Watergate later that day, he had moved out. They went to his home in Nevada, a property he owns. He, he, he had moved. I mean, here's the sergeant at arms of the U.S. Congress refusing reinforcements and then fleeing the scene. Uh, you know, it was an inside job and it was fascist. I mean, the, Trump is not an ideological fascist. He is using the fascists and they are using him. But there is a hardcore fascist movement in America. And uh, the thing that really annoys me about the left that's minimizing this, I read a a statement from from one group, I won't name them, but they said, oh, calling it a coup or an attempted coup is a diversion. This was a grievance led mob impulsively marching on the Capitol. If it was a real coup, there would have been, you know, shots fired and blah, blah, blah. No, this is in American politics, Fascist mobs and white supremacist mobs have been a big factor in American politics. Look at the era after the Civil War. How did Reconstruction, the one little 10 year period where black freedom or at least the promise of black freedom came to life in Southern states, that was snuffed out by racist mob rule. The lynch mob has been a major factor in American politics as an adjunct not separate from or antithetical to police forces, but as an adjunct, as an auxiliary to police forces. And the mob in America has enforced uh, the suppression of black people, uh, especially in Southern states, thousands of people were murdered by lynch mobs. How can can leftists today say, oh, this is just a grievance led mob. You could say that about the lynch mobs too, but they dominated Southern cities and Southern states through the instrument of terror. That's what we witnessed on January 6th, except it wasn't a spontaneous mob. Trump had been saying for months, uh, or at least since December 6th, come to Washington on January 6th. It's gonna be a wild day. Uh, And by the way, all the state attorney, Republican state attorney generals, their association was sending out robocalls on Monday and Tuesday before the Wednesday event, telling people come to save America and to march for Trump. I mean, they all knew what was happening. Right. And, you know, I think it's important to discuss this kind of tendency that we see on the left, not as a matter of, you know, shaming so much, but, you know, we need to have the right response um, for, you know, to, to uh, move into a better place from this, to respond to this properly. I mean, I think there's this tendency for, you know, people, some on the left to not want to carry water for the Democratic Party and liberals and, you know, which use Trump as kind of an excuse to sit on their hands and do nothing for the working class. But, you know, I think that's a really misguided uh, uh, effort and, and really ends up whitewashing the totally fascist nature of this, um, of what happened. And, you know, we have to differentiate between the bourgeois democracy that we have, which is certainly not of the people, the working class, and that's obvious to, you know, to, I think everyone on the left and an actual fascist movement. And, you know, I think I want to, I want to ask you, I guess, about, you know, the response so far from um, the state, you know, we've seen first, I I guess we should talk about, you know, we've seen, of course, Trump um, banned from every social media platform, online platform possible and, you know, Shopify, Spotify, um, like, you know, making a playlist 
uh, for Melania is, is the real threat. Um, and, you know, what do you think of that, the kind of response from Silicon Valley um, shutting down Parler? Um, and, you know, do you think that's the, this, this, you know, I think what is fair to say censorship is the right way to go? Or, um, and of course, Silicon Valley is very much embedded in the Biden administration. Um, or, you know, should there be something more, um, the impeachment proceedings that are, you know, starting right now in addition, and then, you know, should there be charges of um, sedition? Yes, I think there should be charges of sedition. There's no question uh, that Trump was engaged in a seditious conspiracy. I mean, impeachment for uh, someone who's going to be out of office is hardly punishment. Dan, if you uh, organized a violent attack against the seat of government, or if I did, or our friends did in the progressive movement or the Black Lives Matter movement, we'd be in jail right now. We'd be in jail, we'd have no bail, we'd be facing seditious conspiracy, which is more than, uh, which is 20 years in prison. Uh, they use seditious conspiracy against Puerto Rican independence fighters, that's the last time it was used. But this was clearly seditious conspiracy. Some people ask me, well, uh, or said to me, you know, if you support uh, Twitter taking down Donald Trump's account, then Twitter is going to do that to the left. And I was like, OK, I understand that argument. But guess what? Twitter's already taking down accounts from the left. Uh, and if the left did what Trump had done, if we had incited the violent assault by violent mobs against the members of Congress and dispersed Congress, there would be no question that our Twitter account would be taken down and Facebook and we'd be arrested. The fact that a, a day or two after Trump organized and instigated this fascist led assault against the seat of government, the, the, that his only punishment has, was that he lost his Twitter account. I was like, that's it? That's the punishment for a seditious conspiracy? And, and, and you know, the fact of the matter is Trump was using Twitter as are the other fascist organizations to, uh, to incite a fascist insurrection against the US government. And that would, as you put it, be not only the negation of the US government, it would be, if successful, the negation of basic core civil rights and civil liberties. I mean, just look at Germany in 1932 and 33 and look at the outcome. I mean, that wasn't a fascist seizure of power, Hitler, uh, was nominated, was brought into the government by Hindenburg, who was a conservative center-right conservative politician. And the industrialists and the, and, the, and the big shots in the German military thought they could tame Hitler. Well, within a year, he had tamed them. They retained their profits and privileges, but it was his government. And the fact of the matter is, if there's a, if a fascist-led sort of takeover of the government were to take place, uh, it would be of dire catastrophic consequences for the masses of people. Or even if their movement gets stronger and stronger, it's going to have catastrophic impact. So now what, let's look, let's just review the facts. Let's review the facts. Twitter took him off. They said he violated his terms of service by inciting violence, et cetera. That's true. He did that. They also took down 70,000 QAnon uh, linked accounts or accounts that were promoting QAnon. That shows the immense power of the high tech companies. Yes, that's an enormous uh, aggregation of power. From my point of view, those institutions should be uh, under public control, democratic, democratic control. They shouldn't be private corporations. They work hand in hand with the state. They are part of the problem, not part of the solution. On the other hand, if they had not taken these actions, what we would be seeing right now is the proliferation of the expansion of a fascist assault against the existing society and the existing government as we know it. What I think the, I think the way the left should frame it is this. After the seditious conspiracy was carried out on January 6th, the US government was essentially paralyzed. There were no public press conferences by the FBI. There was no federal intervention. Uh, the assault, the, those who attacked the Congress were let out of the Congress. They weren't arrested. They weren't kettled the way you know, progressives are routinely. And then there was almost no response. 
And I think the reason for the paralysis from the ruling class, and the ruling class has this immense power. They invade other countries, they occupy other countries, they carry out regime change, they inspire fascist coups in other countries. We know all that. But their paralysis was the liberals in the government and the government itself did not know how far into the government did the conspiracy go. So the military only spoke yesterday, Dan, yesterday, January 12th, the eight chairmen and in the, in the joint chiefs of staff, including the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, Mark Milley, issued this remarkable uh, letter to 1.3 million members of the armed forces saying this was sedition and insurrection and reminding them that Joe Biden is about to become president. And if anyone engages in sedition or insurrection, they're going to be criminally culpable. It took them a week. That beca that's because they know or did know that there was inside support from the military for what Trump was trying to do. Look at the letter that came on January 3rd from the 10 secretaries of defense, living secretaries of defense. That includes Donald Rumsfeld and, and, and Dick Cheney, liberal, I mean, uh, Democrats and Republicans. Why did they issue a letter that's, that warned Christopher Miller, the Trump's appointee to secretary of defense, after he fired Esper, just three days after the election. Very unusual, right? You fire the Secretary of Defense three days after the election. You start to announce it's a fraudulent election. You put Miller in charge. Trump is obviously looking for others to defect and come over and to upset the electoral outcome. So you have 10 Secretaries of Defense issued this extraordinary statement on January 3rd, warning Miller that he will be held criminally responsible if he violates the tradition and the law that uh, about the military intervening to impact or alter election outcomes. There's only one reason that letter was signed and written and, and issued by those secretaries of defense, because they knew that something was afoot within the military. And we know that absolutely to be the case because there was no reinforcement sent to the Capitol Police even after they were pleading for reinforcements. What do you think of you know, the bigger picture in terms of, you know, what, I guess one of the things about impeachment or even sedition, if, if Trump say is locked up, um, you know, he, he's not, the, obviously there's Don Jr. or anyone else that could run next, you know, the next election and this, you know, uh, fascist movement still exists. Um, so, you know, how does the left anti-fascist um, organize against um, you know, deal with kind of the bigger picture problems. What is the solution for that? Where do we go, uh, even in the case of, you know, Trump being locked up, Trump and his co-conspirators being locked up? You know, every fascist movement to succeed needs leadership, and it needs historically a charismatic leader. Again, Trump, even though he's not ideologically a Nazi, he's willing to work with Nazis and fascists, as we can see. He is their leader. He is their leader. So if he is taken down, if he's arrested, he will be in one way a martyr for their movement, but he will be limited in his ability to actually direct because he would be locked up. So I think it would be a terrible blow to the fascist movement. I think the American fascist movement will fragment again. It did after uh, Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City federal building in April of 1995. That was like this one, maybe a step too far. And there was uh, a pushback from the state and the, and, the, and the fragmentation of the armed militia movements, which were quite strong in 1993 and 94. So I think it would be a big setback for Trump. But, you know, the fascists have gotten a lot of, they've gained a lot of ground recently. So you have 45% of Trump supporters, 73 million Trump supporters, think that what happened on January 6th was a good thing. But that also means 55% of them of the Trump voters don't think it's a good thing. Now, Trump voters are not all fascists, obviously. And there's a great number of people who voted for Trump who uh, you know, are working class or middle class or poor people who have become disillusioned. I'm not talking about the fascists. I'm talking about the non-fascist base. I mean, even Ashley Babbitt, the woman who got killed, uh, she had been an Obama voter, but QAnon, the conspiracy theories, this fusion with religious zealotry, uh, 
the, the sort of the fascist sort of narratives that have been dominating, it's gotten a foothold within the population. But the other issues that are sort of the bread and butter issues, the economic issues, 40 million families facing eviction, 50 million people are in food lines right now. Uh, this is because the government locked down the country after the government, government failed to do that which was necessary to save the country from COVID. So it locked it down in a, in a sort of random fashion. It sunk the economy for big parts of the population and didn't do what other governments did do. Like in Europe, people didn't lose their jobs. They got 80 to 100% of their income. Uh, they, got, they continued to get health care. They weren't put into absolute utter ruin. But for a big part of the American middle class and poor and working class, that did happen in the last eight months, nine months. For To fight against fascism, it can't simply be to lock up fascist leaders. There has to be an educational campaign that discredits fascism, that educates the public about fascism. And the system, the government, must be able to do things that actually make a material difference in the lives of people who without that, if, the, if it looks like the government and the elites running the government do not care at all about what happens to them, uh, they are prone to fascist demagogy. And so we have to have a, a, a number of things are on our agenda. We have to have a militant, massive fight back against the Biden administration's announcement that it plans to do nothing. It's, it's planned to change nothing fundamentally, as he said. Uh, that was what Roosevelt said in 1932, by the way, when he was running. He wasn't promising Social Security insurance and unemployment insurance and the right to form unions. He had a pretty right wing Biden like program in 32. But there was a mass communist party that was forming. There was the Socialist Party, two of them that were forming. The workers formed the CIO. There was fight backs, general strikes in, in three major cities in 1934. That's what made Roosevelt decide, hey, let's give these people something that they really need. So, so we have to have that kind of a movement. And we also have to not be, we have to be very ideologically strong against fascism. And, you know, some people say, well, we have to appeal to the Trump base. You don't appeal to the Trump base by coddling fascists, by pretending that they're not a threat or by downplaying the issue of, of white supremacy and racism. You know, historically, and there are many movements in America's history where an anti-racist working class movement can win over sections of the white working class who otherwise will be prone to fascist demagogy. I'll give you one example. In 1988, in the state of Michigan, Jesse Jackson won the primary, the Democratic primary. In 1972, George Wallace won that state. So in 16 years, a big part of the white working class was able to be moved into the Jesse Jackson campaign. Why? Jackson was running on a black lead, which re would require people to recognize that they, if they were racist, that they were gonna vote for a black man, but it was a black led rainbow coalition of black, white, Latino, indigenous people, Arab Americans, and more importantly than anything, it was against Wall Street. It was against the corporations and against the banks. It positioned itself as a class-based campaign. And that's the kind of leadership and the kind of program that we need in order to fight fascism. Right, I mean, you know, just from- When I say that, just to be clear, it's not Jesse Jackson, the person or his politics. That's not my point. It's that sort of social uh, combination, that rainbow, coalition with a militant anti-Wall Street, anti-capitalist fight back movement that is at the same time anti-racist. Right. I mean, you know, having been to, you know, when I was at this, you know, so-called Stop the Steal riot, um, you know, you could see that there is a hardcore fascist element that's really the muscle on the ground. And then there are a lot of people who, you know, really don't know exactly what they got themselves into. They really just fell for the propaganda that they thought the steel was stolen, you know, the vote was stolen. Um, and, you know, they don't necessarily, they don't want violence. There were elements of that. And I even saw a guy, you know, complaining that uh, he lost his job and he didn't have any money. So there are real legitimate grievances. And, you know, it's not, 
a fully formed, every single person there is fascist. So um, yeah, I mean, when I look at, you know, the response, you know, look at, look at what happened with the Bernie Sanders movement that, you know, it felt like there was so much wind behind its sails just, you know, a year ago going into the primary or even in 2016, that if Bernie had stepped outside of the Democratic Party and the squad and these popular progressive figures and demanded, you know, as we go into this pandemic, Medicare for all, and you know, universal health care, and, you know, everyone had their income guaranteed, this kind of thing, I think we would have seen a totally different, uh, 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 you know, moment on January 6th, um, you know, when, when the, uh, you know, electoral count was, was being certified. And, you know, I just think there's so much nihilism and confusion on the left. And we're in such an unprecedented kind of moment that, you know, we're used to condemning coups in Venezuela and Ukraine and this kind of thing. And it's, at this point, it's become, you know, pretty clear where, where, you know, at least most of us on the real left stand. But, um, you know, I think this, this moment has really, I mean, for myself, it's been really um, a challenge to kind of uh, figure out what the proper positions on a lot of these things, in my opinion, has, you know, changed, evolved, you know, not to whitewash yeah. it, but, you know, I think it's, it's really important. So this is not a matter of, you know, of shaming people for being wrong, but, but, you know, getting to the right place and understanding what's happened, how we got to this point and where we go from here. Um, anything else yeah. you want to say, Brian? Yeah. And I, and I think for, for the left, I just to be super clear about what I believe our position should be, we should not be calling on the government to institute new laws like the domestic anti-terrorism law, which is based on ideology, that'll be just a strength in the hands of the state. And the, the proof of it is that it's not necessary because seditious conspiracy, the language, I have the, the law in front of me, you know, Trump has violated the seditious, uh, the seditious conspiracy law. So you don't need more laws. You don't need more tools to stop something like this. So if the government starts to move in the direction of using more repressive tactics or to generalize uh, that kind of new power aggregated to the state, it will be mainly used against the left, not against the fascists. So we should oppose that. We should point out the fact that they haven't as of yet arrested people. Uh, they, that may start to change now because the FBI, along with the military, along with the big capitalists, they've sort of overcome their paralysis in the last day. And now they're really going after Trump and they're really going after uh, the fascists more. And Trump, you know, Republicans are defecting from Trump and Mitch McConnell and uh, Liz Cheney or, you know, Cheney says she wants to, will vote for, uh, for impeachment, other Republicans will. So it's like one of those moments where after its paralysis and uncertainty, different ruling class factions are coalescing against Trump. So now that we recognize that this new phase is happening, the first phase was the first week was paralysis and inaction. Now the state is showing its authority and its power we have to recognize that the state, given the nature of the state, it's repressive, a character and anti-left, anti-working class and racist character, that to the extent that it adopts new protocols against the fascists, they will be used also and mainly against the left. So our goal should not become to be a, a, a tail to the kite of the Democratic Party, certainly not to be demanding more and more repression. But we do have to point out the fact that the state took so long in order to use its own authority and powers against the fascists, unlike what they would have done with the left, is an indicator that the fascists, in fact, have deep roots within law enforcement, uh, within the judicial uh, system, the justice system, and within the military. And what we need to do is to build an independent working class movement led by us, organized by us on the basis of multinational unity in the struggle for things that are achievable. If we all made, and, and if we have hundreds of thousands of us come out into Washington, where you see black and white and Latino, et cetera, marching together and demanding from the Biden administration, not $600 check or a $1,200 check, but $2,000 each month for every family that's hungry, and for every family that's been victimized by unemployment because of the government failures, a big part of the a base of the, of the Republican Party and Trump will come in our direction. 
not again the hardcore fascists, not the hardcore white supremacists. They are our enemies. But you know, we have to understand the real path forward is a path forward. And we should not be pessimistic right now. Just remember, five months ago, there were 35 million of us in the streets. And now the, the momentum shifted. And it was the fascists and the armed militias in the streets. But this is a moment in history. It's not the end of history. And we just have to keep fighting. Brian Becker, host of the Socialist Program. Everyone, check out his show. You can find uh, all over the place on Spotify. Um, it's where I listen. And make sure to subscribe to his Patreon. And also take a look at uh, ours at Behind the Headlines. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you.